you you subjected yourself to a, a Tony Robbins <laughs> symposium, uh -huh. <laughs> probably the god of extroversion. Yeah, and that was part of why I wanted to go because it was interesting to me, you know, the idea that self-help by definition is teaching us what the ideal self is supposed to be, and here he's one of the foremost self-help kings. Um, so what is this thing that he's teaching? And yeah, it was a very extremely extroverted <laughs> environment. I mean, I was lucky because I really loved to dance, and um, you know, a lot of the seminars, like he would play top 40 music, and then everybody would go out into the aisles and dance to the music. So I was like, okay, I can do that. Um, that's fun. But yeah, you know, it was, it was interesting. You know, he, he was sort of taking the insights of academic psychology, and a lot of them were quite interesting but presenting them in such a hyper extroverted style where you got the idea that to be an effective person he was telling you that you really had to um, you know speak in a very loud voice to be very forthright when you meet people you know all kinds of ways the words introvert and extrovert weren't really used explicitly but if you were more the quiet contemplative type you would get the feeling mm, I'm, I'm kind of not on the right track here and the culmination of of the event was the firewalk which you may have heard of where we all had to, I mean, there were thousands of people at the seminar, and we all had to go out into the parking lot outside the convention center, and he had set up a kind of bed of coals that were about 10 feet long that we all had, were supposed to walk across. Um, and the, the idea being that once you had learned to vanquish your fears, you would be able to walk across this bed of coals without getting hurt, <laughs> without getting scalded. Um, so I don't know, I, I decided that I didn't want to walk across the bed of coals because I figured it might have more to do with just how thin your skin is as opposed to what your inner state of being was. But you know, the, but the atmosphere as people prepared to walk across this firewalk was, you know, everybody was kind of hooping and calling out and cheering and um, banging on drums. And it, to me, it was kind of a horrifying scene. You know, it reminded me of something that you would do if you were a conquering army and you wanted to advertise your latest victory. But, <laughs> but people were really excited about it. Places like the Harvard uh, business school of business, which you visited. Yeah, yeah. They push extroversion. The introverts are weeded out. Yet, it was extroverts um, who gave us the last big financial crash, and it was an introvert like Warren Buffett who sat it out quite comfortably. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'd say that it was extroverts who gave us the financial crash. I would say that it was um, it was a lopsided that there was a lopsided culture on Wall Street where we valued people for acting in extroverted ways. So even introverts were incentivized to behave like extroverts. And what I mean by that is, um, I'm talking about attitudes to risk, which we, you know, we tend to think of introversion and extroversion as just about social preferences. But really what's happening, the thing that distinguishes the two in part is um, attitudes towards risk. Because extroverts have more active reward networks in their brain, and so, when they see something they want, like a business deal or just a, you know, a conversation with an attractive stranger, they go after that thing, they get really excited about it, they have this whole flood of joyful emo emotions, which is part of what makes them so much fun to be around. Introverts have those reward networks, but much less so. And so what happens is extroverts get so oriented to the goal that they actually literally don't see warning signals coming at them so much. Um, and introverts are much more attuned to those warning signals. And now you take that outside of the lab and you apply that to a situation like Wall Street and you have a culture that is um, rewarding the people who orient to their goal and literally don't see the warning signals. And introverts in that kind of a culture, if they go to a meeting and they say, you know what, we should be really careful here because there's a possibility we can get into trouble, those people are often uh, delegitimized. You know, they, they don't advance as readily. They're seen as the party poopers. Um, and what happened in the years leading up to the crash is that we had a succession of events, of financial events, that seemed to prove the risk takers right and seemed to prove the risk avoiders wrong. You know, and they, they came to be seen as nervous Nellies. So anybody who had that more careful, more introverted disposition would have been incentivized not to let it show and not to speak up at those meetings in the same way. If there's a parent of, a, of an introverted child listening and they're an extrovert, mm -hmm. and what? How do they nurture without, you know, and give their kid tools to survive in an extroverted mm -hmm, world mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yet not, you know, cripple them? Right. Well, I mean, the first thing is to 
really start to understand the ways in which your child, um, because of his or her introversion, is quite cool. <laughs> um, you know, to really take delight in who they are. So instead of thinking of it as, you know, an affliction that you now have to problem solve your way out of, to see all the benefits of this way of being. You know, your, your child is probably, um, they probably have access to, um, to thoughts, to creative ideas that they might not if they were sort of more out there. Um, they're often very perceptive. They're often very empathetic children. You know, they have this whole set of ways of being that they wouldn't have um, if not for access to this quieter self. Um, but having said that, you then want from that place of respect and understanding to help them navigate their way through situations where they might actually really want to be joining in the fun, but they're feeling inhibited to do it. And so the key is to take, take really small steps. Um, show them that you're with them and that you're on, on their side, um, but help them punch through their fears you know, slowly, slowly, but surely. Um, I have actually, I should say, I have a whole chapter in the book that is devoted to how to parent an introverted child. And um, I tell the story of one extroverted mom, Joyce, who's who learned about her introverted daughter um, and what she was like. And she started, she, she said that until she understood introversion, her daughter would come home from school and she would be scheduling her and lots of play dates and encouraging her to be out there. But she said once she started understanding her daughter, she approached things completely differently. And she would sit down with her daughter and figure out how many play dates made sense. And, you know, for how long, and if she wanted to leave after half an hour, that was okay too. So there are little adjustments that you can make around the edges. The book is Quiet. I've been speaking with the author Susan Kane and Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, published by Crown, distributed in Canada by Random House.